This video will provide you with a general understanding of spinal nerves. We'll use this plastic SOMSO model to give you an overview. Both of these are sections through the thoracic portion of the spinal cord. We can see white matter around the perimeter and gray matter on the inside. Gray matter contains nerve cell bodies, while white matter contains nerve processes and much myelin, a fatty substance. The white matter contains mostly what we refer to as long tracks, which you will learn about during neuroanatomy. Let's focus now on the gray matter. You see here that it looks like a butterfly. For orientation, this is the posterior side and this the anterior side. The orientation of both of these sections is the same. Notice that there are fibers called rootlets that enter and leave the spinal cord to form the spinal nerves. This region is a spinal nerve per se. The dorsal rootlets are sensory fibers that carry impulses from the body to the central nervous system. The nerve cell bodies for these fibers are located in this swelling called the dorsal root ganglion. The fibers on the ventral side are motor fibers that carry impulses away from the central nervous system. Their nerve cell bodies are located in the gray matter. As will be explained in more detail later, there are two groups of motor neurons, autonomic motor neurons and somatic motor neurons. The autonomic motor neurons are located here in the lateral columns. The somatic motor neurons are located here in the ventral columns. Axons from all of these motor neurons exit the spinal cord in these ventral rootlets which join the dorsal sensory rootlets to form each spinal nerve. A spinal nerve, by definition, forms when both sensory and motor fibers have joined together. It bears repeating that this is a spinal nerve here. Notice that this model has two pairs of spinal nerves. This pattern is at the very core of the segmental organization of our bodies. For example, let's say that this model shows T6 and T7 spinal levels. We have T6 motor and T6 sensory fibers joining to form the T6 spinal nerve and the same thing for the T7 motor and T7 sensory fibers. The nerve roots that we are looking at here are often referred to as a radix. Radix means root, much like a radish is a root. When these dorsal or ventral rootlets or the spinal nerve proper are damaged, it's called a radiculopathy, meaning a pathology of the nerve root. Now let's look at this torso model to help explain what happens to each spinal nerve. Here we have the thoracic region, T1 through T12, and I'm going to remove this segment of vertebral lamina so we can look inside the spinal canal. This is the L1 vertebra along with a small amount of back muscle. As I pull this out and turn it, we see a vertebral body, a transverse process, a spinous process, and some dorsal back muscle. It extends from the lumbar region all the way up the back. Here is the spinal cord with the posterior sensory rootlets and the anterior motor rootlets. Here we see them coming together to form the spinal nerve. Here's the dorsal root ganglion. Right here is where the spinal nerve divides. One division goes posterior toward the back. This is called the dorsal primary ramus. The other division goes to the anterior side and is called the ventral primary ramus. Let's talk briefly about what that means. To ramify is to divide. Primary means first, thus the primary ramus is the first division. Here we see a mass of muscle, and here is the dorsal ramus. 
that dorsal ramus innervates that muscle as well as the skin and tissue overlying the muscle. But this is just one segment of the muscle and skin. Imagine that all of the muscles in this column on either side of the midline of the back as well as the overlying skin are innervated segmentally by these dorsal primary rami. So back to the L1 vertebra here. We see two spinal nerves at successive levels. These are the T12 and L1 spinal nerves. This nerve at T12 supplies this region of muscle plus the overlying skin. And this nerve at L1 supplies the adjacent segment of muscle and overlying skin. Thus we can see how successive spinal nerves above and below this L1 segment innervate these muscles and skin. So let's review. How are the deep back muscles innervated? The answer is they are innervated segmentally by dorsal primary rami. Let's reassemble this model and turn our attention to what happens to the ventral or anterior primary rami, which we've not been able to see except for a short segment in this view. Now imagine that we turn this torso around and look at it from the other side after having removed the anterior body wall and the vertebral bodies. It would look something like this. To get you oriented, here are the ribs with their cut edges so we can see the spinal cord. Coming off the spinal cord are each pair of spinal nerves passing between adjacent vertebrae. We can't see the dorsal primary rami here because they pass toward the back, but we do see the ventral primary rami. Here I'm pointing out successive ventral rami as they ascend to the neck and descend to the sacrum. These ventral rami supply most of our body. They supply motor fibers to all of the muscles of the lateral and anterior body wall and all of the muscles of the neck and limbs. They also carry sensory fibers from these same regions. Let's also look at what happens to the spinal cord. As we follow it down, we see that it ends here. This is T12, L1, and L2. Thus, the spinal cord typically ends around L1, L2. But even though the spinal cord ends at L1, L2, it has already given off all of these rootlets that descend to the lumbar and sacral regions to supply the lower parts of the body. This also illustrates another important concept, that of dermatomes and myotomes. It's easiest to see here in the thoracic region where each ventral primary ramus and dorsal primary ramus emerges beneath the vertebra and rib of the same number. All of the muscles in between that rib and the one below arise in the embryo from a single mass of developing muscle. That mass is called a myotome. Likewise, the skin overlying that same region is innervated by that same nerve, and that is called a dermatome. It is very easy to keep track of dermatomes and myotomes in the chest and abdomen because they remain together in stripes. However, as the limbs grow out from the body, this neat correspondence of dermatome and myotome is lost. We will deal with that in a separate lecture. I want to introduce a final topic, that of nerve plexuses. A nerve plexus is simply a mixing of nerve fibers from multiple vertebral levels. Every plexus in our body is made up of nerves from ventral primary rami exclusively. There are no plexuses that arise from dorsal rami. Here, for example, is the brachial plexus. Brachium means arm, so the brachial plexus supplies the brachium, or upper limb. We can also see here the lumbar and the sacral plexus.